Okay, welcome. Good morning. Hope everybody's had nice coffee and cake in the break. Uh, I'm Mark Ferguson. I'm a wildlife sound recordist and uh, composer, currently based at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Um, I say the UK, it's kind of feels like England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales at the moment. Nobody actually knows what the UK is, but right, let's leave that there. Uh, so I'm, current, I'm starting the second year of my doctoral research at the University of Birmingham. Uh, this is my first ICSC, hopefully not the last, and I have to say whoever had the idea of hosting it uh, in Cali in this wonderful theatre was a genius because it's absolutely beautiful. It's a fantastic venue to, to be in. Okay, um, so before I go into more detail, I'm going to briefly summarise what I'm going to talk about today. It's kind of a, a condensed abstract, an abstract of an abstract uh, of my paper, which I presented. So, uh, in my paper, I've proposed the concept of the real intrinsic, extrinsic, perceptual thread in acousmatic composition. Uh, so, it's not, it's not a fully uh, fledged theory. I can't emphasize that enough. It's more of a, an outline of my own um, compositional methodologies and approaches. Uh, so it's really, it's a way of thinking about my work as a composer. Um, and to outline this, I've drawn very heavily on the spectromorphological uh, discourse of Dennis Smalley. Um, most of you should be, hopefully be familiar with his work, or at least have heard of his work um, with regard to electroacoustic composition. Uh, my paper is perhaps a bit unusual in that that's the only sort of thing that I've really referenced in it. And the reason for that is I wanted to make a very sharp, have a very sharp focus uh, on my own practice-based uh, ideas as a composer and my use of C sound, uh, rather than sort of getting bogged down too much in what other people are saying theoretically. Uh, and arguably, as well, just as a side note, uh, small spectromorphological writings are kind of still the most relevant in many respects for electroacoustic composers uh, thinking about aesthetics and starting out in their own compositional path, at least for acousmatic music. Um, and it's still very much talked about, certainly at the University of Birmingham, um, with its lineage, sort of uh, beast heritage and so on. Uh, and it was, it was the most relevant uh, non-scientific text that I could think of when putting this paper together. Uh, and throughout, I'll focus on my own use of CSON's random number generating opcodes for wildlife sound processing. And that's something that's become deeply embedded in my own research. Okay, so uh, very briefly, my research combines uh, wildlife sound recording. So uh, that's the foundation for everything. For me, that's I'm out in the field and gathering sounds from species, uh, natural phenomena, soundscapes. Uh, and I've been doing that for many years now. So I use a lot of specialized microphones and recording technologies to uh, gather those sounds. So it combines, that's kind of 50% of my work and the other 50% uh, is acousmatic composition. And so what all this basically means is I take my own wildlife recordings, um, that's all I really use is source materials, and I create acousmatic uh, works out of them. So I'll not get into the nuts and bolts of that. Um, it should, for the purposes of this presentation, be fairly clear to people um, what I do. And just to wrap it all up, that's the, the title of my thesis. Um, so broadly composing uh, under the influence, not of alcohol, but of uh, wildlife sound recording. Okay. So, uh, what about C sound then? Well, I'm kind of an old fashioned C sound user, um, a non real time renderer. Uh, so, I'm the kind of guy who'll go and find opcodes and just go off and think about them for weeks and just find interesting ways to combine them. Uh, and I'll spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, I, really, I really like that approach. I don't want it to change for me, it works. Uh, so I'll go off and I'll think about the opcodes and I'll construct my instruments very carefully. Uh, and then I'll use the CLI or terminal, Mac terminal to render audio offline. And then I'll spend a lot of time, in fact that's the most time that I'll spend, just listening to all of this stuff that I've processed and rendered to file. Um, just digging through all of the material to find stuff that I find engaging uh, sonically. It's worth mentioning also that you know, for me, my real-time experiences are very much satisfied um, in the field. So the sound recording 
process actually making wildlife recordings, that is for me the, the real time aspect of my work. So it's a very intense focus, uh, sometimes spending you know, weeks in the field. Actually, I had a recent trip to Scotland where I just spent a week in the Scottish uh, wilderness recording bumblebees. Um, and that's it's so intense for me that when I come back to the studio, I don't want to do anything else that involves kind of real-time interaction or processing with other people. I just want to focus on the sounds that I've captured. Um, so I, I feel that's, that's why I've kind of stayed away from the real-time capabilities of C-Sound. I'm, I'm really quite comfortable with that. I'm mostly using control rate modulation blocks to process and reprocess my samples. Um, with an emphasis on using random or quasi-random, I suppose the proper term would be, uh, opcodes to, to modulate material. So it's really just a case of, of reapplying those instruments uh, to sounds, to begin teasing new sounds out of the, the recorded material. And that new material that comes out of the, the, modulated, uh, what, the modulation I've applied can be completely different from the original recorded source. It can be deeply related. Um, so I'm really interested in that whole process. So what does that involve? What are the kinds of sounds that I'm working with? And the, the role that C-Sound sort of plays in giving birth to, to these new materials. All right, so I think the best way to illustrate this approach is to look at a, a kind of working example. Um, so I recently composed, I say recently, this would have been towards the first year of my research in 2018. I recently composed an acousmatic piece called Deadwood. Um, I think that's a TV series of some kind as well. It just occurred to me, I don't know. Uh, but um, it's an eight-channel work, and it kind of takes a listener in this imagined journey through or into a, a piece of rotting wood, which I actually recorded um, along the Severn Estuary in the UK, not too far from where I live. And the, the main textural component of that work um, consists of the contact mic recordings, internal recordings of a dead branch, essentially. Uh, vibrating in the wind. So once I had laid that textural material down as a basis, I then used uh, an eight-channel panning instrument in C-Sound, which I coded, um, to repeatedly process uh, recordings of wind. So these were other recordings that I processed, recordings of wind, water, different species. Uh, and that was basically after that process, other sounds began to emerge from that. And then I then layered everything together to create a different sound world essentially. Okay. Uh, so the key point then is that, um, the key point really is that from something that was recorded at a completely different source, sounds were drawn out with the processing. Uh, so water, wind, and reeds became millipedes, centipedes, and what sounded to me like beetles, invertebrates, and so on. Okay. Actually, when I tried to explain this to my dad recently, kind of, <laughs> he's a retired mechanical engineer and he was reading the newspaper and he was like, yeah, so this is, you know, using C-Sound to do this. And he sort of was like, <laughs> back to his newspaper. <laughs> like we've all had that moment when we tried to explain what we do to our parents or, or somebody close to us, but they kind of get, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> and then they walk away from you. So, um, Here's a really emphasized, again, a very simplified version of, of what I kind of used for that piece, processing. Um, again, you can kind of, I just briefly sort of describe. So you have the uh, random fluctuations generated using jitter. Uh, that's then normalized to whatever range I was wanting to work with. And then uh, that was patched into the um, cycles per CPS argument of uh, four different random eye opcodes. That output from the four randomized were then um, used as the inputs to the panning, uh, basically panning pairs. So I grouped loudspeakers into four different pairs. Um, and obviously the samples read in with disk in two as well, with some random pitch modulation. So that, I mean, that was just, that's a very, it's a reduced kind of what I was using. Um, and I'd just like to add that there are many, <laughs> probably many, many better ways to do this using granular opcodes. And in fact, I think there's a panning opcode for optophonic. Material. But for some reason, grouping the loudspeakers into pairs actually just sounded better. I don't know why. Um, maybe it was because with the kind of four divisions in the studio, you had some gestural material that was being played back and forth between loudspeaker pairs. Don't know why that was the case, but that's how I did it. My weird uh, compositional 
methods somehow arrived at this. So uh, that's a brief overview. And the key thing about that uh, is the interesting thing to me was really pushing these panning fluctuations to the extreme. So uh, you know what you get to my to my mind, um, it kind of amounts to a, a sort of granular synthesis, really, in a sense, because you have essentially amplitude modulation happening there. Um, but it's the amplitude modulation is between these loudspeaker uh, loudspeaker pairs, so it's kind of spatial amplitude modulation. That's the way I thought of it, using panning as the the modulation vehicle that way. Um, and again, there are probably much easier and more logical ways to do that from a coding perspective, but um, that's how I arrived at it. Okay, so to listen to some examples, uh, here's what happened um, just sort of when I used this instrument uh, throughout the composition of, of Deadwood. So this is the input, this, this is one input, um, a recording of reeds and wind, uh, which I made on the Severn Estuary in England. So that was one input, fairly you know, noise-based material, open for uh, whatever processing you want. <clears throat> processing, which I've just outlined, very simplified version. And then this is an extract from what came out of repeated processing with that sort of C sound algorithm that I outlined. So this is an extract from uh, uh, Deadwood. So what's happening here, methodologically speaking? Well, for me, there are kind of three perceptual processes uh, at work, and they seem to guide my creative uh, practice in the form of what I've chosen to call um, real, intrinsic, extrinsic, perceptual threads. So three kind of threads of perception. And they're really interlinked components of a compositional pathway, but I'll speak about them in that sort of linear sense today, so real, intrinsic, extrinsic, just for the sake of clarity. So I'm going to look at each of the components separately. Okay, so the real. Uh, this is obviously the recording element of my work, so perceiving real world elements, gathering real sounds, um, laying a foundation. Uh, so recording species, natural soundscapes, uh, natural phenomena, soundscapes, and I obviously gather those elements as a wildlife sound recordist, uh, and that forms the basis for all of my work. So um, that's me. The placing a microphone on a floor to try to record some bumblebee sounds uh, out in the field. Um, okay, so once I've gathered the sounds, I've catalogued them, I've filed them away, I've noted all of their elements. Um, I'll then select the materials that I want to work with, and I will move on to what I call the intrinsic perceptual threads. So this occurs after initial processing, and the material then becomes quite abstract. And this is where the perceptual focus is very much in the, the raw sonic characteristics of the material. So what we might call a, 
leaning towards a very just listening approach. Um, and all of that happens in the studio, and Smalley talks about that um, as an abstract, a relatively objective process. So it's a microscopic, intrinsic, intrinsic listening. So looking into the sonic material. What is this? Is it a birthday cake? Is it a wall? Um, you know, is it an abstract painting? Not sure what that is. But if they were sounds, that's what I'd be working with in the studio. So not really making any connections to something in the real, something outside the material. Just the raw sonic state. And then finally, the extrinsic. So with continued processing, I start to make these external connections, and that's what happened with Deadwood. Um, so certain material suggested invertebrates, millipedes, centipedes, to, to my ears. You know, that, that's what I thought of when I repeatedly processed the material. These sounds kind of emerged out of it. And again, Smalley talks about this, how the uh, electroacoustic music encourages these kinds of external um, connections. And it's linked very strongly to his concept of source bonding, which is our natural tendency to relate sounds to sources and causes, and to relate sounds to each other. So no matter how much you try to get away from this, and I very, very firmly agree with that, uh, the human tendency for good evolutionary reasons is to associate sounds with something. There's a reason why yeah, a lion roaring sounds like a lion roaring, because it's good, good to know that, all right? And that's what we associate the sound with. So, those abstract colors that I showed you, mm, I've processed them more and more and more and actually kind of sounds a little bit like a bumblebee wing maybe or a bumblebee foraging in a flower. That's what it sounds like to my ear, that's what I visualize, so I'll, I'll work with that. I'll keep processing and see where that goes. Okay. So, just to try to wrap all of this together, um, this real intrinsic, extrinsic thread concept uh, it's a good way for me to think about my own compositional uh, processes and the, the perceptual elements behind each, each one. And as mentioned at the start, it's not really a, a fully fledged theory, it's just a way of thinking about my creative process. And just a few other considerations as well. I've got three minutes left, so this is okay. Uh, this whole random, randomly driven C sound processing uh, aspect I find that it very much complements my work when I'm out in the field as a wildlife sound recordist. Uh, because, you know, there's the processing methods, the sounds that are drawn out of that through random quasi random applications of processing, is very much a behavioral consideration. And when you're out in the field, you know, the behavior of nature, for that matter, the, the wider world, uh, can be regarded broadly as following the laws of nature, but, um, you know, when seed value is set to zero, anything could happen, so to speak. Uh, so you never know what's going to pop out, you never know what's going to emerge from the sonic fabric. And I think there's a nice parallel there between wildlife sound recording and uh, randomly uh, motivated or randomly driven processing. Uh, the other big thing, I've discussed this concept as if it somehow progresses linearly, so from real intrinsic to extrinsic, but of course all of those elements are intertwined. Um, there are cases where my compositional decisions, for example, in the studio, uh, might reinform my perception of the real in the field. So for example, when I created these detailed invertebrate sounds with Deadwood, uh, it actually influenced how I try to record pollinator sounds, insect sounds, actually in, in real life. Uh, to the point where I'm now trying to actually physically record the body and wing detail of insects using microphones d directly inside flowers. It's not a very easy, I don't recommend it. <laughs> I really don't, it's not, the, it's not easy, but I, I really enjoy it. Um, so there's a direct methodological influence from sea sound processing there, which is quite interesting to me. Uh, and finally, any one of these threads, as I call them, could be truncated. So I might want to leave the real material just as it is and have this kind of look Ferrari approach where you broadly let the material speak for itself. Uh, or I might want to go very abstract um, and just leave the material, uh, just present material that's not really, or is very difficult to associate uh, extrinsically. Um, or I might want to, to have a mixture of all those different elements. So I might want to, and that, that's actually what I'm veering towards as a composer now. So leaving some recordings untouched, then layering with 
material um, that I've processed to create a new sound world that's relatable, um, and also just layering some abstract material that's, that's not really, it's very difficult to associate externally, um, just for effect or sonic contour. All right, uh, that's the conclusion of my talk. Thank you very much to all of these folks. Thank you to you for listening. And I think um, hopefully we have enough time for some questions. <laughs>